kind of mind do you have? One that goes a thousand miles wide or a thousand miles deep? Are you the big picture person or the detail person? Are you a fox or a hedgehog? The story of the fox and the hedgehog takes us back to Greek antiquity and Aesop's fables. There, the fox is described as the big picture animal who knows a little about many things and who roots around endlessly trying to find more. The hedgehog, on the other hand, is a protective creature who rolls himself up into one big idea focused on digging deep into a single solution to a single all-absorbing problem. Which is the genius more likely to be, fox or hedgehog? The point of this session is to suggest if you want to be a genius, perhaps be the fox. In the long run, foxes seem to be more impactful. In 1779, the English man of letters, Samuel Johnson, formulated the issue this way, quote, the true genius, Johnson said, is a mind of large general powers accidentally predetermined to some particular direction. Okay, fair enough. General powers, particular direction. But which comes first? Business entrepreneur David Rubenstein in his book How to Lead suggests that transformative people specialize first. We'll call that plan A. Rubenstein says, quote, Focus your energies on truly mastering one skill or subject, then broaden your areas of focus only after credibility has been established with peers and others in one area where you are the master. End quote. But one can, on the other hand, start as a generalist and gradually narrow one's focus to a specific field. That's plan B. Charles Darwin seems to have taken that route almost unconsciously, experiencing many fields, ancient languages and a bit of biology, at first in school, and then anatomy and medicine at Edinburgh University, and then theology at Cambridge University, then learning geology and more biology on his own. That's the approach often recommended for a good education in the United States. Get a generalist liberal arts degree in college first, and then pursue specialized study in law or medicine or science in graduate professional school. Of course, fox and hedgehog can coexist peacefully within one and the same person. That's plan C. When Albert Einstein worked intensely toward a PhD in physics, he and his friend formed a book club, more reading, the Olympia Academy. For general reading, they read ancient Greek plays by Sophocles, as well as Cervantes' epic novel Don Quixote. And most important for Einstein, they read philosopher David Hume's treatise on human nature, of which Einstein said, quote, I studied it avidly and with admiration shortly before discovering the theory of relativity, end quote philosophy, influencing physics. At the end of his life, Einstein was trying to prove a theory of everything in the universe, his unified field theory. At age 50, Darwin had figured out how and why all living organisms evolve. By the end of his life, Shakespeare seemed to know about all of humanity, and that which he didn't know, he invented. So it seems that the power to go wide is what generates impact, and as we have seen in our previous session, is fueled by curiosity, courage, and a bit of cunning. Over time, the fox sees many things, and with many things in mind, can conceive of new things. Is it possible to know too much about a subject? Is it sometimes better to know too little? Psychology professor Donald McKinnon of Berkeley once said, quote, all too often the expert knows, both on theoretical grounds and on the basis of empirical findings, that certain things are not so, or just cannot be done. The naive novice ventures what the expert would never attempt, and often enough achieves success, end quote. 
Thus, maybe we should do what Nikola Tesla enjoined, quote, have the boldness of ignorance. Again, the boldness of ignorance. Sometimes success comes to the fox because it doesn't know too much. As Natalie Portman said during her 2015 Harvard commencement speech, quote, your inexperience is an asset and will allow you to think in original and unconventional ways, end quote. Similarly, failure may come to the hedgehog because it does know too much. Cognitive entrenchment, or the intelligence trap, it's variously called. Nobel Prize winning economist Daniel Kahneman, in his book Thinking Fast and Slow, points out that narrowly focused experts, no matter how famous, do less well than wide-ranging generalists when it comes to pre predicting the future, often because their egos as specialist experts are too invested in the prediction. Does your specialist doctor ever jump to an absolutely certain yet wrong conclusion? Perhaps because he or she has seen these very symptoms many, many times before. If so, both you and your doctor may be experiencing expertise syndrome. Again, curiosity and diverse experience, a broad view, they matter. Recent studies have shown that Nobel Prize winning scientists were nearly three times as likely to engage in a fine arts activity as were their less distinguished colleagues. Max Planck, a Nobel laureate in physics, wrote songs and operas. Werner Heisenberg, who gave us the first formulation for quantum mechanics, was a skilled pianist. Famous atomic physicist Edward Teller was both an excellent violinist and pianist. But it is Albert Einstein, the personification of genius, in whom we usually see the embodiment of math and music. Why such diverse interests? Diverse interests provide perspective and, as we shall see later in this session, allow for new combinative ideas to occur. As Foxy Steve Jobs said about Apple during a Stanford University commencement speech in 2011, quote, it's in Apple's DNA that technology alone is not enough. It's technology married with liberal arts, married with humanities that yields the result that makes our hearts sing, end quote. A marriage that makes our hearts sing. That's a poetic way of saying allows us to ingest and process different kinds of information, value a variety of human experiences, and weigh issues from different vantage points. All these form the basis of critical thinking. To end this opening segment, one that extols the cross-border thinking of our friend the fox, let me quote the words of two geniuses, one well-known, the other little-known. First, again, Albert Einstein, who in this passage warns scientists against excessive specialization. Quote, every serious scientific worker is painfully conscious of this involuntary relegation to an ever-narrowing sphere of knowledge which threatens to deprive the investigator of his broad horizon and degrades him to the level of a mechanic, end quote. And finally, the words of the man who has been called history's most underrated genius. Yes, history's most underrated genius. Who? Claude Shannon. Who? Yes, until recently, I too never heard of Shannon. But not being inquisitive enough or enough of a fox, I didn't know about the early history of the computer, and thus I knew nothing about Claude Shannon, who has also been called the father of the information age. Anyway, here's what little-known genius Claude Shannon says about the information age and specialization. Quote, In these days, when there is a tendency to specialize so closely, it is well for us to be reminded that the possibilities of being 
at once broad and deep, did not end with Leonardo da Vinci or even Benjamin Franklin. Men of our profession, again, more gender discrimination here, men of our profession are bound to be impressed with the tendency of youth of strikingly capable minds to become interested in one small corner of science and uninterested in the rest of the world. It is unfortunate when a brilliant and creative mind insists upon living in a modern monastic cell." End quote. Shannon here mentions two of history's great polymaths, Leonardo da Vinci and Benjamin Franklin. Let's follow his cue and take a closer look at these two, as well as a few other foxy polymaths. <laughs> 